I'm Cindy Kelly. I'm in Richland, Washington, and it's Monday, September 10th, 2018, and I have with me Pete Klein, and my first question for him is to say his name and spell it. Keith Klein, K-L-E-I-N. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I passed. Huh? Good job. <laughs> At any rate, um, I've known Keith for a long time, which has been really fun. Uh, but I'm going to have him start at the beginning, before I knew him, tell us a little bit about himself and where and when he was born and about his education and how he got to be um, here in Washington. Well, uh, thank you, Cindy. It's uh, it's obviously great to see you again. It's been uh, been a long time. I um, uh, was born in Morgantown, West Virginia. Grew up in the uh, the fifties, and uh, that was during a time when uh, you know, as a school child, we were doing the the duck and cover drills. You know, there was the great Russian menace, Soviet menace, um, and. Uh, Things nuclear were, you know, at least from the the eyes of a, uh, someone that's, you know, growing up and, um, you know, grade school and so forth was was something of mystery, of awe, of uh, intrigue, and I, I think uh, uh, at least subconsciously uh, therein kind of uh, um, the spark of, of what ended uh, for me a, a career in dealing with, with things nuclear. And um, uh, from there, I ended up uh, uh, going to Cornell University as an electrical engineer undergraduate, and then um, um, signing up with the what was in the Atomic Energy Commission, the Atomic Energy Commission, which still, I think, just resonated in my, in, in my gut, uh, with a program that was going to um, create more fuel than it used. It was the liquid metal fast breeder reactor program, and, and they actually had a, uh, uh, an intern program that was uh, uh, very appealing. I, I did not come from a, a wealthy family, and they would agree, uh, you know, to pay for uh, uh, continuing education of which essentially resulted in a master's degree, pay a salary, be uh, assigned with a contractor, get to work in D.C., and, um, and I would in turn owe them several years of, uh, of, of work in exchange for what they would be in, investing in, in, in me. And uh, so I uh, uh, worked for a year in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. And, and I should say this is too following the Atoms for Peace uh, initiatives, so we're going from from s atomic swords to plowshares. Nuclear energy was was a good thing, and and it had the the promise of uh, of what was at least in my mind uh, clean, secure, indigenous uh, uh, source of energy, and the idea of making more fuel than it used um, had had a had a great deal of appeal. So uh, uh, working with the Atomic Energy Commission. And breeder reactors and being able to continue education, and so forth, uh, was um, uh, had a great appeal to me. I, I ended up going to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, got a degree in uh, nuclear engineering, masters in, in nuclear engineering there. Um, had a, 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 a an assignment out here at Hanford, actually constructing the the fast flux test facility. So I was actually assigned to a contractor. My supervisor was a contractor. Um, and it was out in the field constructing what, to me, is a, you know, a nuclear engineer, just a, a very beautiful machine, both physically and from an engineering standpoint. All this beautiful stained, polished stainless steel, uh, all these workers coming together, coordinating something coming up out of the ground, huge pieces of equipment, just finely precision engineering and designed and, you know, controlling this, this very concentrated source of power. So, um, you know, it was, it was a very exciting time for me, and uh, so I worked here for uh, over a year and then was back to Washington, D.C., and working in the, the core branch for some fellows that, uh, you know, were there during the birth, and, uh, you know, worked for uh, uh, Rick Over and, and others that were, were harnessing this, this power. I know Dixie Lee Ray was uh, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and 
she lived in a trailer in a parking lot outside the, the, uh, uh, where the Atomic Energy Commission headquarters were. Had these two Irish wolfhounds, you'd see them walking or the guards walking them. And um, so it was, uh, you know, it, it was a very fascinating time. Um, and, uh, you know, I never thought I'd really make a career of working for the federal government, but the, the opportunity to work with people that are in on the ground floor and, uh, you know, to, to learn from them, to see them, to be, to be part of this, and working again at the Atomic Energy Commission, it was, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it just resonated. It felt good. And I, and I felt good about what I was doing, the breeder program. Of course, you know, as, uh, as you advance and learn more and, you know, socially and, and, and otherwise, your perspectives change, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in so many different ways. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the breeder program, uh, I think the anti-nuclear movement was, was starting to, to rear up. Uh, um, Three Mile Island happened and and other things that ended up, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, greatly uh, curtailing the, the dream and promise of, of commercial uh, nuclear energy and, you know, and demand for nuclear fuel, which then came back to the breeder program, as well as concerns about reprocessing and proliferation of this nuclear technology, because uh, 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 breeder reactors depend on re separating out the plutonium from the fuel and putting it into a, um, you know, new fresh fuel rods. So that's how it, it bred more fuel than it, than it used. But that technology can be used in separating plutonium. It can also be used by, uh, uh, by rogue nations or whatever to, to construct nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. But in any event, I got a, a good foundation education in, in, in nuclear matters, radiation, some health physics, and and so forth. And um, I remember it was Jimmy Carter's presidency, and um, the breeder program basically uh, uh, took a dive, and you know prospects of, of that continuing uh, diminished. And and so I started thinking, well, maybe this is a good time to to leave the government and start doing some other things. But uh, as it was, um, uh, another opportunity found me there, and it had to do with deep geologic disposal. Uh, uh, and this would be dealing with disposing of the waste that was coming out of the commercial reactors as spent fuel. And uh, I said, you know, that, that could be an interesting thing to do before I, before I make my exit. And uh, so I got involved with that, and, uh, which was, again, a keenly interesting edu education because uh, you're know, working with geologists and you know, looking at a number of different sites across the country and how can you isolate these, these waste for thousands of years. Still a noble cause. This is, a, this is another good thing. It, it appealed to the Boy Scout in me. Um, uh, but working with, with geologists and, and you know, recognizing, you know, that this is um, uh, a lot depending on the science of being able to predict what's going to happen thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future. And considering, you know, what's uh, a swamp now can be a desert later and vice versa. Uh, you know, a lot's going to depend on, on, on science, technology, modeling that really hasn't been, been developed yet. And, you know, geologists, are, in my mind, we're still trying to figure out what happened in the past, let alone getting them to predict what's going to happen in the future, uh, it was going to take longer than, you know, than I had patience for, at least at that point in my career. Um, so again, I was getting ready to, to leave and then, um, <laughs> Another opportunity arose, and this had to do with at reactor storage and things like monitor retrieval storage. Given that uh, you know the uh, the timeline for developing geologic repository was was going to be quite long, and I said, well, you know that that could be interesting. You know, about transporting nuclear materials and waste and other other good things. So I, I ended up uh, getting involved in in that and developing technologies for dry storage at reactors, set up a demonstration at some Virginia Power and Duke and, and others that were basically led to these dry storage casts and other things that are, that are around and some ideas for uh, how you could put, encapsulate them in these dry storage casts that eventually get transferred to a repository, whatever. Um, 
And uh, uh, again, after I uh, said, okay, I've done that for a few years, it's, it's time. I think this, uh, well, then I, I did a little stint in uh, new production reactors, and that was to uh, replace the, the tritium reactors, tritium production. It seemed, you know, the national defense. And, uh, uh, you know, I still had this, these roots in, um, in nuclear engineering and uh, interest, fascination with that. And the position was actually when, uh, with uh, safety and quality, so it'd be overseeing the, the safety of, and comparing the safety of a few different reactor designs. And uh, I, I uh, did that for a, a couple years, and then again, saying, okay, it's, it's really time to, <laughs> to, to move on here. I'm really, you know, end up spending a lot more of my uh, professional time in, in the government than I had ever uh, anticipated or actually wanted. Um, but then the uh, environmental management happened. <laughs> so I progressed from the offices of nuclear energy to, which was controlling the waste situation, the office of civilian radioactive waste management to, uh, um, you know, the, 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 you know, what was to become the, the NNSA, National Nuclear Security uh, Agency, and, uh, and then, um, Back to the uh, office of environmental management, where I uh, and where I met you, uh, Cindy. Uh, well, first I was uh, uh, had a job in the in the safety aspect, so that is office of safety and quality, and there are a few other things in the in the title there, or or, uh, or maybe it's even uh, at react, uh, you know, the storage and transportation. I uh, a few different positions there, but um, eventually. Uh, 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 after a few years, was asked to uh, um, by Tom Grumbly, who had been named assistant secretary, to be um, was affectionately known as EM3. So it was like a executive officer, chief of staff. Uh, you know, not the deputy, but the, the, the kind of the third person. And um, that's where I got to know you and a number of others and develop a respect for, for Tom Grumbly and kind of see how things operated at, at, at that level of the government where uh, Tom had, had uh, come from um, uh, where he was a, uh, an aide to uh, Al Gore when Al Gore was a senator. Uh, I, or, yeah, senator? Congressman. Yeah, senator. Um, and so he had lots of fascinating insights into how things worked on the Hill, the dynamic between the the executive branch and the um, um, uh, legislative branch and the, you know, the agencies, budgeting, policy, politics, the whole interface between society, technology, and uh, dealing with things on, on, on that scale. And, and that was a, another fascinating uh, learning experience and it, it got to meet a number of, of, of interesting good people who brought in like like you, uh, Cindy, and a number of others. Um, and then um, uh, Rocky Flats happened. And this, you know, was a raid at Rocky Flats, the FBI, uh, in, uh, in the late 80s. Uh, um, uh, they were struggling to, to go from a production mission, producing the pits, to a, a cleanup mission. The Defense Nuclear Facility Board, Facility Safety Board, had been... Uh, uh, been established and uh, been very critical of a number of things that were happening in, in Rocky Flats. Uh, I think Mark Silverman had been named the uh, uh, the manager out there, and and, and there were just a, a, a lot of issues. Um, being as close as I had become to Tom Grumbly and others, he asked me to go out there to serve as as Silverman's deputy and help try to sort through and and resolve a lot of these issues. And um, so my deal with Tom was, yeah, I'll be glad to do that. But, you know, if, if Mark and I hit it off and it goes well, I'd like the option to be able to stay and continue out there. Basically, you know, I've, I've been here in D.C., Creature Headquarters for all this time. I really want to, to go out in the field and, you know, get some experience on that end and then, you know, probably end my, my federal career. He agreed. I became the deputy out there at Rocky Flats. I was there four or five years. We were dealing with stabilizing plutonium and dealing with regulators and uh, any number of, 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 of management, technical, political, 
uh, you name it, issues, labor, uh, j just the whole banana play of, of things, uh, secrecy, coming out of secrecy, a lot of very dangerous materials. Uh, you know, plutonium in an unstable state is, um, uh, is very reactive and pyrophoric and, uh, you know, it was in liquid states, solid states, uh, you name it, things and, you know, be, if not managed correctly, things would go critical. Uh, so, you know, a lot of, of, of safety, health physics, nuclear safety, um, you know, fire, uh, you name it. And, and the buildings were, were not getting any, uh, um, you know, younger, obviously, too. So you're constantly dealing with uh, seals degenerating, uh, people not knowing necessarily where things are, losing some institutional knowledge as people retire, and, um, you know, regulators putting more and more pressure on, and, you know, budget challenges, and, and, and so forth. Uh, long story short, uh, I was there for, uh, for four years. Um, uh, Jesse Roberson, who was, uh, was named uh, the manager at Rocky Flats after when uh, Silverman uh, retired, she asked me to stay on as, as her deputy. I did. We developed a, a good working relationship. Um, um, uh, and then in uh, uh, late 1998, 1999, came to a point where um, there's limits to what we could do cleaning up Rocky until WIP got opened. And George Dowles had left WIP, and there were some number of issues there, operational issues, obviously legal issues were continuing. And um, uh, so uh, uh, Jesse and consultation with the headquarters folks ended up volunteering me to, to go down and be the acting manager at, at Carlsbad uh, and try to, to get this thing over the, over the finish line, open it up so we can ship our transuranic waste down to, down to WIP. And uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, they, they did it with, with my, certainly with my, my agreement and uh, another good thing to do and an interesting challenge. So, so did that. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that, uh, that night when we got the first shipment in and uh, it was, it was uh, about two or three in the morning and uh, we had ended up having to delay it the night before because of fog and, uh, you know, there's the TV cameras, antics by the opponents of WIP. I mean, they're putting things in the road outside of Santa Fe and last minute um, uh, attempts through the courts, including naming uh, Bill Richardson and myself as, as a public menace. Uh, in the state of New Mexico because we wanted to move this plutonium out of Los Alamos. And um, uh, so we had to send lawyers out at midnight to uh, deal with, uh, you know, filing for a preliminary injunction to stop the shipment. So and, any number, I mean, you just, you, you, you can't dream these things up. So, um, but in any event, uh, we, we finally got the, uh, uh, the, the shipment in and it was... Um, you know, just one of those moments that's just kind of seared into my, my memory because, uh, you know, I'm on the phone, you know, coordinating things from, uh, you know, again, after midnight, early hours of the morning and with uh, the, the state patrol and the governor's office and, and other things like, like that. And then, um, so we finally got things coordinated. The shipment was on the road and is approaching um, Carlsbad. Uh, the, the mayor, Carlsbad, and myself um, got into a, uh, you know, one of the local police vehicles and met the, 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 uh, the convoy uh, with the first cask of, of transuranic waste outside of Carlsbad. And, and we followed it, or I think maybe even led it into the town. I don't recall which. The people in the city of Carlsbad were out there on the streets at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, clapping and cheering and holding signs. So we went through the town and then drove out to the, the site of this convoy. And there, uh, uh, you know, the workers at WIP were, were all there and, and they're clapping and cheering. I mean, they had been working on this for, you know, 20 years. So it was, uh, you know, achievement of, of something that had just been so many years in the making. And it, it's, 
Um, I have the picture at, at, at home with me and the, the mayor and some of the city fathers there, and uh, you know, clapping and cheering, and it was uh, it was an awesome awesome thing. So from there, um, um, Secretary Richardson ended up asking me if uh, uh, if I would come out and be the manager at, at Richland. Um, it hadn't wasn't something I had thought about. <laughs> But considering that I had worked here in the early 70s uh, building FFTF, I uh, was somewhat familiar with the town. And, um, of course, there were all sorts of issues about Hanford, and I didn't know what was true, what was not, uh, uh, you know, what was going on. But it, it, was, it was viewed as, a, as the toughest site in the, uh, in the environmental management complex. And a, a nuclear... Uh, I don't remember what the which act was that uh, ended up creating an office, separate office of river protection, just to deal with the tank waste. So, um, uh, oh, and, and just to backtrack a, a second, when uh, when I was asked to 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 go to WIP from Rocky Flats, um, you know, I said, well, I'd be interested in doing it, but I I don't you know want to stay down there indefinitely. And they said, okay, well, just get it open and find a replacement. And all's good. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> you know, I'll give it my uh, my best shot. That uh, um, so uh, when well, I was down there, and you know, obviously getting it open, and the next thing became well replacement. And that's where I, uh, you know, talking to a number of people, including uh, Pete Lyons, who's on Senator Domenici's staff, and so forth. The name of Inez Trie came up. And of course, Inez since uh, made her mark, but uh, I met her in a hotel in Santa Fe, interviewed her, and you know, this is obviously a very, very smart lady. She was the one that uh, worked at the Los Alamos and to make sure that the first waste coming into WIP uh, had no RICRA constituents. So it was, we do it clearly under Atomic Energy Authority Act and not have to uh, um, involve the state and all the permits and the things that went along with their authority under, under RICRA to regulate mixed, uh, 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 mixed waste. So that was a, a key part of our strategy to, to, to get it open was, uh, you know, this first one is just going to be pure, simple. And Inez was re responsible in the Los Alamos end for, for doing that. So uh, I knew her by phone and, and some other things, working with her to get those first shipments uh, 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 ready for, for shipment to WIP. So uh, uh, Inez was named to be the, the permanent, my successor at, uh, at Carlsbad, and uh, did a fantastic job then uh, uh, getting the, that uh, production ramped up and starting getting those casts, uh, shipments, transuranic waste in there like, like clockwork. All right, so back to, uh, to Richland. So um, uh, my job at Richland, according to Bill Richardson, was... Uh, again, not a, not a whole lot of instruction. It was figure out what the problems are, uh, fix them, and help set up this Office of River Protection. And, you know, tell me what you need. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go again. Um, so came out here, uh, did my homework, uh, um, you know, learned a number of things at, between Rocky and Whip. Worked for Tom Grumbly about how things work, and uh, Richland was uh, at Hanford, indeed, uh, a very complex place, a, a lot of history. Um, I mean, my goodness, you, you look at what was done here and the time frames and uh, the workforce and just the, the politics of, of of Hanford, and it's um, you know, it's 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 just amazing. And of course, again, going back to my Atomic Energy Commission roots and so forth, the first uh, full-scale productor, you know, reactor, nuclear reactor, uh, you know, B reactor out here. There's, uh, you know, a few holy grails of, of nuclear technology that that out here. So I, I came with a, a, a deep respect, appreciation for, um, you know, what was done here, good and bad. Uh, I don't. Think you, you do things that were done here without, um, particularly under uh, the pressures of World War and 
uh, things like that where things are just moving fast and uh, there's a premium on, on action um, and uh, you don't have the luxury of, of maybe analyzing things to the degree that uh, we, we do now. Um, I can talk some more about that later if we want to talk about uh, challenges of, of getting on with dealing with, with these wastes. So my job was set up this Office of River Protection. Dick French was to be my counterpart as uh, a head of the office, first head of the Office of River Protection responsible for dealing with the, 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 the tank waste. And um, obviously that was a, a major part of the issue here. And to me, that's, this is good. It makes the rest of the, the job more manageable. Someone else just focusing on, on tank waste. But there's still, uh, you know, the, the site is very much integrated uh, in terms of, uh, you know, labor agreements, people, uh, just even physically. It's, it's, it's going to be hard to just take something and say that's totally separate. So a lot of interfaces there, things that need to be worked together. And, and not to mention, uh, there's still um, very significant uh, uh, challenges dealing with the, uh, uh, you know, things besides tank waste here. There was the spent fuel, which had issues, uh, 2,000 tons of, of spent fuel that were just left in limbo after uh, stopped reprocessing in the what, late 1980s, 88, I believe, um, and that was deteriorating, crumbling actually in the spent fuel pools. Uh, and just as at Rocky Flats, plutonium that was... Uh, you know, in the production line, various stages of production, liquids, solids, um, you know, you name it, uh, several, several tons of, of, uh, of plutonium um, that, that needed to be dealt with. Didn't get the same attention, I, I think, maybe as the tanks, probably maybe because of security issues on classified and uh, and so forth, but, um, and then obviously so much contaminated uh, liquids have been poured into the soil column and there were solid, solid waste buried in various places and stages during the, the, the history of, of Hanford and uh, obviously a lot of regulatory concerns and you know this is you know in the late 80s I'm sure you'll hear from others and Michelle and, and a little more detailed knowledge on this but you know with the environmental laws put into place um, is a new consciousness and transparency into, uh, I think, the weapons production complex. And, um, you know, both what had been done, right and wrong, and what needed to be done to, to clean things up and to come into compliance with, uh, you know, more modern day environmental standards. Here there was a, an agreement put in place called the Triparty Agreement, signed in 1980. 89 that provided a, a framework for basically coming into compliance with uh, RICRA and CERCLA and I'm sure you'll um, uh, have, have heard more from people and the regulators are experts on that so uh, and, and there were timelines time frames established in this uh, this agreement which was you know backed by uh, uh, by law in the courts and um, I would say uh, a lot of those agreements and plans were uh, were agreed upon without a whole without things being thought out in detail. How are you going to do that? I mean, maybe as much based on faith as 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 plans, as detailed, realistic plans in terms of what funding is going to be available, what it's going to take place. I think. You know, we typically are optimistic when we, we think out how long it'll take to do something and it's, it's more like what it should take rather than actually what it actually will take. And, uh, and it, you know, we think we can do it for a lot less than it ends up actually doing. And face it, when you're dealing with all the anoniums that we deal here with Hanford, uh, you don't know the, the existing conditions. And oftentimes it's not till you get in there and explore and, you know, for lack of a better term, play with these things that you really understand what needs to be done to, to either stabilize them, to treat it, to package it, to, to move it. And um, 
so there was a lot of reconciliation that needed to be done between the, the, the promises established under this tri-party agreement, these commitments, and, and reality. And um, a lot of parties involved. So, uh, you know, therein comes one of, in my mind, the biggest challenges of, of dealing with um, uh, nuclear waste at a, at a place like Hanford, and it, it comes down to communications and, and alignment. Well, the tri-party agreement is, is an agreement between three parties, basically. The, uh, the Department of Energy, the Washington State Department of Ecology, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And the way the environmental laws here work uh, in this country and the, on the federal side the Environmental Protection Agency has lead responsibility and in some cases for some categories of waste they can delegate that responsibility to the states. And um, so the comprehensive environmental um, reclamation and liability see, uh, circle, <laughs> environment, comprehensive environmental response uh, <laughs> yeah. liability, yeah. liability Act, there's another C in there, I think. Uh, conservation, maybe? Environmental um, yeah. Response Conservation and Liability Act. It establishes a, a framework for, um, you know, that includes designating sites as being on the national priority list and naming responsible parties for who's to clean up and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, sites, not just nuclear, but uh, you know, chemical toxic sites um, around the country. Uh, so that was the, the EPA's main, uh, main authority uh, and Hanford was named one of these, it actually has been to four um, sites on the Superfund list, this national priorities list. The Resource Conservation Recovery Act, RICRA, is, um, you know, deals a lot with the, the, the treatment, storage, and disposal of, of chemical waste. And that primary authority ends up with the, uh, uh, with the states to, to implement, and the states have their own laws. So on the Atomic Energy, I should back up, on the Atomic Energy Act, uh, the regulation of, of nuclear materials was reserved for the federal government and um, therein lied part of the problem. Uh, for example, at Rocky Flats that was all done under the cloak of secrecy. Of course it was all nuclear weapons and sensitive nuclear materials. You're dealing with, with tons of, of plutonium when uh, it all it takes is, is pounds to create a weapon. So, you know, you're, you're guarding and safeguarding not, not only information, sensitive information that could be used by, um, you know, malfactors or uh, uh, the, the bad guys to, to create uh, uh, weapons or, or countries to, to create weapons. You're also dealing with, um, you know, quantities of, of, of special nuclear material uh, sufficient to <laughs> create hundreds, thousands of, of weapons. So, you know, obviously a, a great need to, to protect this, both the information and, and the materials. So a cloak of secrecy uh, around that, but that kind of goes counter to then uh, oversight of uh, how are you conducting your processes in, in, a, in a way uh, and, and how is that affecting the environment? And again, uh, you know, this is a uh, during a time when, uh, you know, I'd say enlightened consciousness is the impacts of man's action on, on the environment. Uh, I mean, whether it's, it's, it's air pollution, water pollution, chemical pollution, you name it. So how do you bring the, this nuclear weapons and industrial complex into, um, into the sunshine and compliant with these laws? So recognizing it's been operating all these years under its own kind of internal uh, laws and, and priorities. So um, uh, the states in, in some cases, in most cases, designated a authority to deal with the 
uh, I'd say the, the lower levels of activity of, of waste uh, to regulate within their boundaries the uh, uh, low level waste and um, in some ways mixed waste where there's uh, some of these wastes are, have both a radioactive or nuclear waste constituent as well as a, a chemical um, uh, waste constituent that is clearly under the, uh, the, the jurisdiction of the state. So you have the EPA, the Washington State Department of Ecology, and the Department of Energy, each with some responsibilities and authorities, liabilities for, for cleaning up these wastes. Um, DOE is the, obviously the, the, the performer, the one that needs to do it. Uh, and this EPA and the states are the ones with the hammer saying, uh, you know, if you don't come in compliance within a certain time frame, hammer is going to come down on you. We, you know, our job, our responsibility is to, to enforce. So we're reconciling the enforcement, the need for enforcement and coming into compliance with decades of doing things without uh, 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 the kind of structures and laws that were put into place to safely treat, store, dispose, and remediate um, these sites and, and facilities and materials. So that, in a nutshell, is what the tri-party agreement was, uh, was about, is agreement between the three parties of how we're going to do this over uh, tens of years, basically. And um, there was a fair amount of optimism built into this uh, that I, I, I came to appreciate and understand. So I, I, coming here, um, you know, I sought out people that I thought could advise me well as to who are the key players, what are their concerns, how does this place work, um, what's in the way of progress, what, what constitutes success. Um, obviously, uh, a Hanf the Hanford area had become uh, socioeconomically quite dependent too on um, uh, the work out at, at Hanford and um, Pacific Northwest National Lab is uh, uh, you know a lab that was developed to support the work that was done here. I mean, sciences like health physics did not exist. You know, what are the effects of radiation on uh, the uh, on on cells, human or animal. How do these um, radioactive constituents move in the environment? How are they, you know, the fate and transport of, of these, these contaminants? What does it take to, to stabilize, to protect? And uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Lab was kind of the, the science research arm of a lot of these, these efforts while the weapons and nuclear materials were being uh, uh, developed and, and produced here. And, it became an entity in and of itself and um, you know, went on to become, on its own right, uh, world-renowned and doing research in any number of areas, energy, national security, you know, biology, uh, you know, mathematics, computer science, so forth. Uh, a, a lot of things that kind of grew out of um, uh, the technologies, uh, things that were, were done here to, uh, to produce weapons material. So I um, came here doing my homework, talking to people, trying to understand the lay of the land, priorities, challenges. Uh, one of my lessons learned at Rocky Flats was, was uh, you know, even though most of us in the Atomic Energy Commission that came up through it, or I'd say a lot of us, engineers, technical backgrounds, um, the the challenges that dealing with cleanup go go well beyond the technical. And unfortunately, there's a tendency of us technical types to think you can solve anything with a new widget, new technology, and other and so forth, uh, but. At Rocky Flats, I learned that that's really not not the case. And um, you know, in my mind, it's it's people that clean up these sites. It's not technologies. Uh, the technology part is actually, in my mind, the easy part. It's um, getting people aligned 
towards some common objectives and goals that they can understand, they can feel good about doing, uh, that can be rewarding, can meet their personal needs as well as their ethical, moral uh, uh, needs. And um, it's, it's, it's very hard to achieve that, that alignment. People come into these things with their own, in some cases, narrow interests. In some cases, there may even be other agendas at play. Um, there is lots of money involved. And whenever there's lots of money, there's, there's just lots of issues and other things that come into play. Um, you know, the department operates, does these activities, these sites through contracts, big contracts, multi-billion dollar contracts. And with big incentives for getting things done, their, their fees be paid, and big penalties if, if, you, uh, if you don't do it well. And, um, you know, this can result in, in a lot of pressures, good and bad. Um, so, you know, how the contracts are designed can have a, a, a huge bearing on how work is done or, or not done. Uh, similarly, um, you know, obviously the, the concerns and, and needs of the regulators needs to be uh, uh, kept in mind uh, constantly. Uh, there needs to come in compliance. Uh, we don't have an open checkbook. Uh, the government is, is constantly needing to, to manage its resources to prioritize. Um, I'd say that there is um, clearly a lack of, of uniform perspective on uh, the risks of the various facilities, materials, conditions uh, out here. And uh, depending on your background, education, experience, etc., uh, you come at this from from different perspectives. It's it's very easy in in, in my experience to um, build on the fear of of what people don't understand, and and to sensationalize, to dramatize, to to, to scare people. And it's very understandable. Uh, as a nuclear engineer, I'm far less concerned about plutonium and radiation than I am about chemicals and um, biologics. Um, because I don't understand them. But from my standpoint, the nuclear materials are easy to detect, predictable, um, you know, and, and detection and monitoring is, is a big part of, of, of managing these things. You, you need to know what you're dealing with, where it is, what kind of time frames, how reactive, uh, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, you're basically dealing with three, four kinds of radiation, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, neutrons. Um, so, uh, you know, we've developed a lot of personal protective equipment, procedures, and so forth to, to, to deal with that. But from the outside world, these are nuclear waste. These are million gallon tanks filled with dangerous nuclear materials that can last forever, or plutonium, uh, things, the stuff of, of nuclear weapons, of bombs, of, of, of this, that, and the other thing. And, of course, the, you know, the popular media loves the, the drama and the sensationalization. And uh, I mean, we saw it at Rocky Flats, Building 771, built as the most dangerous building in, in America. I was there at the time. And, uh, you know, something I never thought of it as being the most dangerous building in America, but I could see how ABC News or whatever could uh, characterize it as such. And who's to, to say otherwise? I mean, uh, you know. I certainly don't know what other buildings there are in America, what kind of hazards there are. Anyway, um, so, uh, you know, a lot of different perspectives and dynamics that, that drive the cleanup. Uh, you know, you get the press, the media involved, lawyers, uh, uh, you know, emotions. There's come translates the pressure on the, our elected officials, uh, senators, congressmen. They, they raise it up to the highest levels of the Department of Energy. 
Next thing you know, the hammer's coming down on, well, why are you doing this? And what's that about? And what's going on? And it's, it's, you spend a lot of time trying to communicate and put things in perspective. And, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. So again, um, you know, the challenge of these cleanups, in, in my mind, a lot comes to, to alignment, where lining people up on the objectives, what the priorities should be, contracts that incentivize the appropriate behaviors of people, and, and particularly as it translates down to the, the, the workers on the ground level. And, and in my mind, you know, physically you want to clean these places up, it depends on the people that are out there in the field. Uh, the workers that know the facilities, that understand the materials, and um, uh, again, I, I learned this at, at Rocky Flats. Uh, if, and the lesson learned there is if, if we look out for them, they'll look out for us. If they don't think we're looking out for them, they're gonna protect themselves, as any of us would. And, um, it was not until at Rocky Flats that changed the nature of the contract such that, that allowed that alignment with the workforce uh, and, in, and included uh, alignment with the regulators. And it was a different environment, so it was, it was in some cases easier to do it at Rocky Flats than it is uh, here, but we've seen similar contracts at, at Fernald and, and We'll talk about the, the river quarter uh, here because I, I think we achieved it here with the river quarter. Um, but getting the contracts right is can have a dramatic effect on how people behave and ability to, to, to align all the people that need to be aligned to, to do these jobs safely, efficiently, productively. Uh, and and a, without all the sensationalism and external kind of influences that can just um, uh, suck up an inordinate amount of, 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 of management time and energy trying to deal with. And time and energy that really should be focused on supporting the workers in the field and getting the, getting the job done. A good return for the taxpayer dollars and, you know, um, and, and making sure we're protecting our, our, our workers. And uh, to my mind, the, the, the more bureaucracy and different players and others are involved, the, the greater the, the, the challenges in, in achieving that, that alignment. Um, we, um, and, and I, uh, you know, can dovetail into some other um, kind of lessons learned here uh, along the way of what it, it, it took to, to do things done and what has changed or, or is changing. And this even goes back to the, uh, uh, the beginnings of when I, I think about how fast B Reactor was built, how, how fast, uh, you know, tea plant reprocessing canyons and others were done under this wartime environment without computers, without cell phones, um, but with a lot of people aligned because we needed to win a war. And, you know, our troops were, were dying overseas and there were clearly evil forces at, at play from, from our standpoint. So um, amazing things done in amazing periods of time, but in hindsight, not necessarily the way we do things today. Um, and environmental consequences to, to be paid as, as a result. And, uh, you know, hundreds of waste sites, burial grounds, facilities to, uh, to, to, to be remediated. Um, but, you know, there was a, a, a concise, controlled command control structure with uh, you know a workforce that was was willing and you know believing and, and, and trusting for for the most part, um, over time, much much has changed. I, I would say when I came here in uh, late '90s, early 2000s, I I felt good about the authorities that I had 
the trust that was placed in me and the trust I had in my counterparts uh, back in Washington, D.C. And, and, and we had good communications. And um, I was authorized to take risks that I thought were, were reasonable and measured. I would, I would consult. Uh, I certainly wouldn't do things unilaterally. Uh, but to get the spent fuel stabilized and moved, plutonium stabilized and moved, uh, in my mind, we had to move pretty fast. And I did not have time to um, go through a lot of elaborate processes to seek approval. It's, it's so much easier for people to say no than it is to say yes when you're dealing with, with these materials. And um, particularly if uh, there isn't uh, an environment of, of full trust and, and cooperation. So, um, and that is something that I, I seems to have have evolved and, and changed with time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all clear that uh, the current people have the same kind of authorities and uh, that that I had to, to to do things, or that that that, that constructive environment uh, still exists. I mean, there's always going to be tensions and debates and arguments, but usually, you, you know, the way our government works, and God bless it, um, you know. These things can get aired in a in an honest forum, and people that are authorized to make decisions can make informed decisions based on a variety of inputs and considerations. And you, you need to trust in their their judgment and um, and, and integrity in, in, in moving forward. And but it's also important that the basis for decisions get communicated, understood, and and and, and be supported. I've i found that if you just unilaterally do things that uh, uh, it doesn't provide time for uh, to develop that alignment all the way from from top to bottom. Uh, so one of the first things I did here uh, in coming is is brought together leadership around and say, okay, what are we what are we trying to do here? And that ended up with a a vision that I went around the the site, <laughs> stand on the back of a flatbed truck or. You know, wherever there was, uh, and God bless, Colleen French was my uh, right-hand person uh, uh, helping me with this. Remember, I'm an engineer, so, you know, this is not the kind of thing that I naturally just think up on my own of, of doing. But giving a good idea, I'm pretty, usually pretty good at, at recognizing it and taking advantage of it. So, anyway, what we came up with, with this group of, of leaders around the site, contract and others, was... What we're really trying to do here is um, um, we call it the river, the plateau, and the future. And we're, we're trying to clean up along the river corridor. These are the areas that are close to the river where things that get in the river, they get mobilized, transported. So, um, you know, we want to get those things cleaned up. We want to transition the center portion of the site to basically a long-term waste management area. That's where the, the high-level waste tanks are, on the burial grounds, other things like that that are going to take uh, decades to clean up. And depending on the large facilities, the waste treatment plant, others, and, and, and so forth. So, you know, we basically want to clean up along the river corridor, shrink the active footprint clean up to the center portion of the site, and, and not lose sight of the future. Whatever that is, we're we're dealing with a lot of people here, a huge workforce, large socioeconomic impacts. These are the people we need to clean up the site. We need to take care of them, you know, now and into the future. Uh, we can't just just ignore that and think this is just a technical problem, and that you know we just need to hammer in uh, technical solutions. So that was uh, kind of the, um, the the rallying cry used and tried to explain and. And, and I, I'd say it was well received. It's pretty easy to understand, to, to visualize, and um, and I think it has endured. And we were able eventually to uh, carve out a, a contract that was focused on the river corridor, and um, a contract that was uh, uh, patterned after Rocky Flats and Fernald that um, you know provide the right incentives. And and I think it proved that. 
we can do things here in a highly productive, efficient mode. Um, if the work scope is defined, work with the regulator so you have records of decision, clear scopes, and so forth, and, and you basically leave the people alone, support the workers, and not try to uh, you know second guess everything that's that's done when it's done and and, and how and make great strides in cleaning up the, the the river corridor and now there's a new opportunity with the center portion of the site uh, uh, how we we deal with that and uh, I'm, I'm hoping my successors uh, uh, are able to to figure it out and put in a, a great set of new round of contracts the reality of the, the dangers at Hanford versus the, the perceptions of the, uh, the, the dangers at, at Hanford. Um, I, you ask a hundred different people, you're going to get a hundred different, different answers. But I, I would say I, I probably have a somewhat unique insider perspective as to uh, those hazards and, and, and perspectives. And um, I... Uh, in general, I think a lot of a lot of the the hazards have been overblown and over dramatized to the detriment of actually getting on with with dealing with them. In some other cases, I think they're they're underappreciated. Um, when you're you're dealing with risks, you really have to look at the the full spectrum of risks including the, the risks of inaction. And in, in many cases, in my mind, the, the risks of inaction can outweigh the, the risks of proceeding with a good solution, even if it's not necessarily the best solution. There, it, there's always something that can be a little bit better, a little bit improved. And, um, you know, the enemy of the good can be quest for, for perfection and basically paralysis by analysis in which nothing gets done. So, uh, for example, um, I look at tank waste and the waste in those tanks vary considerably from tank to tank. So to try to apply um, a one-size-fits-all fits rule to those tanks is in my mind a prescription for greatly prolonging uh, getting on with it. That if something is is in a quote high level waste tanks ergo it is high level waste is just not right. Uh, a lot of the the liquids in those tanks are are not nearly as dangerous as what people people think. There's a lot of liquids it needs to be dried out, stabilized, and treated. Um, but it's not as dangerous as waste in some of the other tanks that are very hot radioactively, thermally, or that may have some um, uh, um, you know, biological, chemical, other constituents that could evolve hydrogen and, and, and you know, present a you know, different kind of hazard. So that's number one. Number two is the risk to the workers versus the risk to the environment. Risk near term, risk long term. And, and trying to, to compare those. Um, you know, yes, there's, there's some risk to leaving things in the ground. But there's also, in, in longer term, and trying to put that into perspective, how great are those risks? Well, how is it going to get out? You know, you don't necessarily, you don't think it can, but we don't necessarily know everything. You could have climate change or whatever, but so what if it does? Is, is that going to be uh, catastrophic or manageable or inconsequential even? Um, is, is that risk worth the risk of sending in workers to, to deal with this in the here and now? Um, and, and one of the things that, that really pains me is um, spending what I consider to be extremely valuable worker capital doing things with marginal return from a risk reduction standpoint. 
and particularly with an aging workforce, is we're losing uh, men and women that with hands-on knowledge of what was done, how it was done, what this valve does, um, you, you know, type of thing is a is is a terrible thing to squander, and we really need to to m maximize utilization of those those folks while while we have them. Uh, that's very hard when you're 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 dealing with you know 77, 66 high level waste tanks and trying to treat them all like they're they're very high level. We could be getting on with, in, in my mind, um, treating a, a lot of those wastes and doing it in a, in a much more expeditious uh, manner and um, without trying to necessarily, I don't think everything has to be put into glass, uh, particularly if it's a lower activity waste. Um, you look at how much we have to, to clean out of these tanks before we can close them and dispose of them. Um, you know, all these these issues are risk versus risk. Uh, we're trying to balance the, the, the cost and expense of, of, of what you're doing in the near term versus the consequences of not doing it in, in, in the long term. And I think that um, the reality is that there are lots of waste already in the soil column at Hanford above the water table. And these are either purposefully disposed of, even the facilities are being actively managed now, the Environmental Restoration Disposal Facility, IRTF, uh, uh, there are solid waste burial grounds, some liquid waste burial grounds. Each one needs to be looked at, but the intent is not to retrieve all those wastes. So you look at the mass of what's going to be disposed of IRTF in the central plateau versus, well, what if we were to just get the liquids we can out of some of these lower activity waste tanks, grout it and leave it there. You know, geographically, this place is a pretty close proximity. You have this big mass in Erdif, is in my mind, small amounts of radioactivity in these lower activity waste that would be left there. Uh, do we, is it really worth the time and effort and expense of going after that last little bit? you reach a point of diminishing returns in, in dealing with these things and that's where I, I think um, um, you know further alignment is, is, is needed with the regulators and the community and, and others regarding uh, you know balancing the need to get on with stuff while we can, while we have the workers, while we have the money um, to, uh, to, to get the most productivity out of uh, you know out of this um, you know, like I said, while, while we can. Uh, airborne radiation has always bothered me more than uh, the stuff that's already in the ground and uh, stabilized. So taking down facilities, demolishing them, I, I think is, uh, can easily be, be underestimated. Uh, uh, um, facilities deteriorating, like the tunnels, Purex, and, and some things like that, I think cast a light on uh, 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 things that need to be done uh, near term, should be done near term. You know, the tunnels weren't an issue. I think it's overshadowed by all the hype about the high level waste tanks uh, when in fact there are these other things that, that uh, uh, need to be paid attention to and it, it can and should be, be done. I mean, it all needs to be done, but we can't do uh, and don't need to do uh, it all in a, in, a, in a Cadillac sense. And I, uh, it, it pains me to see things get generalized in a way where kind of the, the worst tanks or, or, or actions get generalized as if that's what's all over. And, um, and that just further slows down the process or, or try to, puts pressure on the system to to clean up things to levels that are not warranted. Um, I, uh, I think again this, this comes down to uh, how that it can be easy to, uh, to prey on fears of people that don't understand and, and, and know these things, uh, particularly by the, the popular media and, and um, um, And there are constantly uh, uh, people that um, uh, 
that I think are uh, are in fact pursuing their own agendas for for whatever reason that you know I don't pretend to understand, but you know I see things occasionally and it just causes me to shake my head and, and you know how can they say these things? Um, and I, uh, I I feel bad too that a, a you know significant portion of the workforce seems to have been become alienated, um, are not feeling uh, cared for, and uh, there's a lot of complex rules and laws out there covering things like workers' compensation and, and health benefits and a lot of uncertainties too. I mean, there's there are folks that have worked out here that are genuinely sick and that need help. And um, uh, they're not necessarily getting the help and support that they need and deserve, in part because it's not necessarily clear how or why they, they, they got these, these conditions. Could be related to Hanford, might not be related, but the fact are, they, they need help. And the system has, has let them down one way or another, fallen between the cracks. That, you know, because of federal laws, if it's not clearly demonstrated as a result of Hanford, then, you know, certain programs can't come into play. But still, there may be other programs that can. So, um, you know, is, is if we're not dealing well with those things, then, uh, and you have new people coming on board on site, they don't understand this stuff. They've never worked with it. Uh, you can, on the internet and Google, a lot of these chemicals and other things that are, you know, 10 syllable long words and discover these ailments or possible ailments that no one ever heard of. You can breed paranoia, fear. I mean, it's my gosh. I, I'm, I may be breathing these things and it may be affecting me. No one can tell me that it is or isn't. I don't know what I'm breathing at such low levels. Um, you know, all these things, we, we really need to get on with it while, uh, you know, while we can. And, Things are not going to get better with uh, with time, and uh, so I think uh, um, attention should be should be really paid to the uh, you know more invest in getting the workers involved, even the, the community involved, and, and a get on with it attitude, and um, and, and the regulators and, and recognize that uh, uh, quest for for perfection is is works against getting on with. Uh, with doing things, and I am convinced we have the technology and the wherewithal to to clean up this place safely and effectively, and do it in a reasonable time frame. And it's it, it's just people in the way. Just people in the way. Just people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the hardest thing. I mean, people have emotions, they have feelings, they have perspectives, histories, and who's to say that you know one's you know, right and the others, uh, others wrong, and we have processes and mechanisms for dealing with these things, but they all, they all take time. So I guess it, it comes down to, to leadership and, and vision and management and, uh, you know, getting a, a sufficient alignment to, to, to move out on, on these things. And, you know, my, my hopes and prayers are with the new, <laughs> new administration that they'll be able to, uh, to figure it out. It's, it's complex, it's hard, it's tough. And I, I, I have to applaud, I'm gonna segue into something different here, but at some points I, I did wanna make sure I have a chance to, to make before my, uh, my time is up here. Um, so many lessons learned here. So much that has, has been done that is, is um, you know, is just remarkable. Uh, from what can be done physically if people are aligned in a short period of time, wartime environment, to um, you know what it took to do that, the people that were displaced, impacts on the tribes, um, the, the 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 folks that that used to to live at, at the Hanford Town site and White Bluffs and and so forth. Uh, we have some of the most pristine shrub step environment in the Pacific Northwest preserved of what was going on here at Hanford. Same time, the materials that were, were produced here were used for weapons of mass destruction. Um, you know, things that, that happened here have, have changed, the, changed history 
changed the lives of, of, of so many people. Uh, so many lessons learned, good and, and, and bad. And uh, that's where my, my hat's off to you, Cindy, and to the Atomic uh, uh, Heritage Foundation for um, capturing as, as much of this as, as you are, as you can, and, and doing so that we, you know, we truly learn from these lessons. Uh, I think we can be inspired by all the positive things that were done, some of the technologies that were spun out of, uh, of Hanford, the good things that continue to be done here. We can be, um, you know, mindful of some painful lessons learned, uh, the, the, the negative consequences, uh, reflect on um, we haven't had uh, another world war since. World War II, might that be because that, uh, okay, we, we have these new weapons that uh, really make people think twice before going so far, yet the forces that drive wars are still at play, the competition for energy, for natural resources, for land, for uh, uh, who knows what, and we haven't sociologically learned how to deal with that, with poverty, with, you know, clean water. Um, so, um, so many lessons uh, uh, learned, so many impacts that, um, you know, like to, to feel like they are being captured and that people, their future succeeding generation can learn from it. And again, I, I, I just certainly appreciate what, uh, what you and the uh, Tommy Carriage Foundation are, are doing to, to achieve that. And I really appreciate what you said about the work. Do you have any comments on on the downwinders? And I, mean, I think you probably were out here when a lot of those studies came. Uh, or maybe it was before you got out. Here. Yeah, that, that was well, that was before I got out here. And um, no, I, I think the the courts have done a, a good job at parsing out. Um, the impacts and trying to deal with it, although it took so much longer than it seemed like it, it should have, than it, than it needed to. 24 years. Yes, yes. So, uh, um, you know, good, good, you know, eventually we get there, but again, it's, it's another one of these, can't we do better? Shouldn't we be able to do better? Well, what could we do differently in hindsight? Um, we could be, in, in some cases, dealing with the uh, same thing here with Hanford uh, tank vapors, where you know obviously a lot of concern and um, how much of that is is, is real versus perceived, or uh, it, it, it it's hard to say. Um, I mean, the vapors are real; they're they're in the tanks, and um, in my mind, all the more reason to. Um, to stabilize them and, and uh, you know, reserve the waste treatment plan as that comes online for dealing with the, the worst of it, but getting on with um, emptying and, um, and dealing with the residuals in as many of these tanks as, as we can. So I, uh, you know, miss of Hanford, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at, at some of the questions I was asked, have been asked by, by smart people. Uh, I remember being approached by a, um, an eye doctor here locally who was looking to recruit another eye doctor for his practice. And this physician was um, concerned about, was hearing about Hanford and, you know, is the water here safe to drink? Is the air safe to breathe, and this is a physician. And, and he, this, uh, this I, other, I don't know, friend, and it's asked if I would be willing to talk to him, to reassure him, and, and I did. And um, the boogeyman is, is alive and well out there. Uh, you know, how people get these impressions uh, is beyond me. It's, it's locally, I'd, I'd say our community we all know people that work out there. You know, we drink the water. We accept it. We understand it. We don't seem to be as concerned about it as 
is some of the folks in, in Seattle or Portland or, or other places, and Lord knows what they're hearing and, and believing, what information they, they have. It's, it's so much easier to scare somebody than it is to, I think, um, you know, it can take years and a lot of education. So um, even things like uh, well, detected radiation on the air filters and some of the cars out here at Hanford. Well, there's radiations everywhere. It's, it's part of our life. You need to put that into, into some perspective. Um, but from the outside world, if that gets sensationally publicized, it's like, gosh, there's plutonium floating all around the air at, at, at Hanford, and no one knows uh, where it is, where it's going. And, um, you know, again, the, these things, I mean, the, the people may be thinking they're, they're sounding the alarm and doing a, uh, us a favor, calling attention to some of the problems and challenges out here, but um, it often, I think, just works against us. It, it just distorts perspectives rather than adds perspective, and I know it's not the job of the, of the media to... Um, um, to, to educate and 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 in these things that we've all seen how they're they're more prone to dramatize, sensationalize, get viewership, and and so forth. But um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the the uh, the boogeyman is alive and well, and and pushing the buttons in in Olympia and and, and elsewhere. To uh, I mean, you know, our elected officials they they react to the voices that they hear. And they hear from ones that are vocal, that are getting attention, and, and um, you know, maybe the loudest, squeakiest voices. And, uh, you know, a lot of those voices are, are not from, from here locally, yet they, they seem to have as much of a vote in what happens here and how it happens as, uh, as anybody. So... Um, you know, I think there's obviously very good people in, you know, the regulatory shops and, the, uh, you know, the, the political offices and, 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 and so forth. But I think it's just a sign of our times. This is, you know, countries divided. People get their information from various places and it's easy to subscribe to conspiracy theories and not know who to believe and what to believe. And uh, to me, all these things are all the more reason that we, we, we need to really get on with cleaning this place up and doing it in a, in, in a realistic uh, manner and, and doing what we can, when we can, as safely, efficiently as we can and, and not let the, um, um, you know, this, the, the quest for perfection uh, keep us from getting on with what we really need to do. Uh, but I, you know, one of the things I'd love to do, Cindy, and I, I've proposed, no one's taken it, I, you know, Tom Fitzsimmons and I, he was head of ecology. We, we initially, you know, button heads. Uh, but the more we talked to each other, I, I think the more we understood where each other was, was coming from and what was driving us, and the more we, we, we tried to uh, put each in, ourselves in each other's shoes and think about, well, how can we get our respective agencies past this and, and do some good? And uh, I developed a, you know, a great respect for him, which you know, continues to this day. And um, he and I have, have talked about, I thought, uh, you know, we ever had a chance to facilitate some meeting of the minds of like the regulators and DOE and, and others to, to work through some of these issues like the definition of high level waste, circular, you know, the, the application of circular versus RECRA for some of these cleanup things. You know, like tanks are cleaned up under RECRA, you know, some point it really should be circular, it seems to me. Uh, you know, it's, it's the EPA authority versus ecology authority and you know, and they have different perspectives on, on these things. Um, you know, there, there are a number of, of kind of inside baseball things that I, I think could, uh, could help 
pave the way for getting on with, uh, with cleanup in a more productive and, a, and, a, and a, an efficient way. Um, but um, um, so far, no one's taken us up on that 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 offer. So, uh, and, and I think it's because most people they understand the problems. I think they can they can deal with it, and hopefully they they can. You know, I know there's there's efforts relooking. I've heard some of Van White's recent talks and, and speaking. I think she's you know on the right path. It, but again, my experience is. Good ideas are a dime a dozen. There's lots of people out there with lots of great ideas, but people with the ability to translate that into action and make stuff happen as a result is much harder to find and, and, and deal with. And so going from that good idea to, to reality and practicality is a, is, is a big leap. But love to see some people get together be able to, 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 to do that in a in a different kind of form, come up with a, it's almost like hit, hit the reset button. We are where we are. We really do need to get on with this. You know, if we we're just starting from a clean sheet of paper, what will we do now with, with what we got? Uh, I think you could see some vastly different uh, uh, protocols and, and, and ways of doing things and a, a different kind of alignment. That Tom and I had set up something we called the Cleanup constraints and challenges team, and we had workers there. We had, uh, you know, from the workforce, with uh, contractors, the DOE, the regulators, and uh, and we talked, and it was facilitated. We talked about why can't we get this done faster, that done faster. What's in the way? The workers would come up with one perspective that you know, management would sometimes say, you know, "Really? We didn't know that was what's going on." Or manage to come up with something, and uh, workers or regulators say, "Oh, we didn't understand that," and, and it's just uh, amazing. But we're, uh, it, it seems like from a management standpoint anymore, we're so balkanized, you know, and everyone's in their own swim lanes. It's 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 labor, it's it's the you know EPA, it's ecology, it's it's DOE, even different parts of DOE, and um, we need to break through that. You know, and I, I think just drawing the and basic inherent good of people that really want to do the, the right thing if given the chance. <laughs>